I do want to go into a few of your of uh, a few of the things that you have in the books and some of the stories that you tell because um, again, there's so many wonderful stories that you found in there that it's just it, it it's amazing where you found it all. Um, and I, one of the ones that I want to start with is what you already mentioned, Benin. And you have this Brazilian who goes to Benin and becomes a slave trader there. And uh, I, I seem to remember the Washington Post, I want to say three years ago, ran an mm -hmm. article talking about the, the legacies of slavery in Benin, of how some leadership in the state is still kind of tied to the slave traders. And also that Smithsonian Institute was trying to contemplate like museums um, related to slavery and the slave trade. So um, can, you, can, you, can you talk a little about whether this has actually moved forward? How, how is the memory landscape in Benin um, evolved? Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, the, uh, the, the, the issue of memory of slavery in Benin uh, is much richer and these debates have been there, uh, I would say, uh, earlier before then in uh, many places, including uh, many places here in the United States. Um, I did the field work then, uh, more extensive field work in Benin in 2005, and this was already almost a decade later when uh, then the debates started earlier before, in the 1990s. Then UNESCO, for example, that I am a member of this International Scientific Committee of the Slave Root Project of UNESCO. And that project was unveiled uh, in WIDA, that is in Republic of Benin. WIDA was the, the second largest uh, slave trading port. Uh, then during the era of the Atlantic slave trade, we, had, uh, we have Luanda in uh, Angola, that was the first that exported the largest number of enslaved Africans to the Americas. But then you have WIDA that is there, that city that is still exists, uh, that has a rich heritage that, uh, from that period. Um, but the, the, the country then, th there was always a consciousness of this slave trading past. Uh, Benin was uh, then the, the, the power, then all different European powers were present there in WIDA with even forts, for example, the Portuguese, the French, uh, uh, the British, the English. Um, uh, I think that, uh, if I am not mistaken, even the Danish had a, a, a fort uh, there, uh, but the Portuguese were, and the Brazilians, uh, they were very, uh, they had a strong presence in that area. But at the end of the 19th century, when the slave trade was already ended, uh, those who colonized that, uh, that part um, of West Africa were the, the French. Then we find there, uh, individuals uh, who uh, were indeed the descendants of slave merchants who established, who settled there in the 18th century. And uh, we also have uh, their then descendants of uh, enslaved people who returned from Brazil to that area and who settled there. In this community, they formed a single community. Uh, then with descendants of enslaved merchants, descendants of um, enslaved people, and then we had, of course, the, the descendants of the, the royal family of uh, Dahomey, who were uh, then, uh, who also enslaved people, then who waged war against the neighboring um, states and groups and uh, sold them into slavery to the Americas. Then there is a consciousness that uh, in that society, there are people who are descendants of enslaved merchants and uh, descendants uh, of enslaved people, descendants also of uh, the royal family. And uh, in the early 1990s, there was debates, public debates about that. Uh, in the newspapers, for example, that, that there was a debate uh, about uh, uh, who we are, for example, all the discussion on reparations that I became interested came from these debates that I would read in their newspapers uh, there in Benin. Um, and this idea that how we deal with that in a society where we have indeed people who are descendants of victims and descendants of perpetrators. And more than that, we had descendants of enslaved people who once they settled back there, 
they became uh, slave merchants themselves. Then it shows how this, this, all this is complex, but they started indeed the, the, in Benin doing this, uh, memorializing this uh, past associated with slavery in the Atlantic slave trade in the early 1990s by building monuments. They built uh, an entire uh, road uh, with uh, different stations that has memorials and monuments. Of course, now it's in a state of decay. Uh, the, there is a door of no return after they added just nearby a door of return. Then there was a monument of the Catholic Church that was added just next to that, even if the Catholic yeah, Church right. fully supported the Atlantic slave trade. In any case, they, are, they know that about that past. And of course, you have the uh, statues honoring the, the slave immersion and so on. And when that uh, journalist, he went to Benin, it was, I think, during a, a Vodun festival that they have there uh, in February, he contacted me uh, to, um, that to ask about Benin and so on. I think that I am quoted in his article, but he was pretty much transporting the views from here, there and say, Oh, but uh, the, here we are grasping, uh, then you are uh, grasping with this past, mm. uh, with the Confederate monuments, they are not doing that there, which mm. is not really true. Uh, but you ask it about the Smithsonian, but I, I will come back because uh, it's becoming too long. <laughs> well, I, I, I just, that was just fascinating too, of kind of like the, and that's again, something that we oftentimes overlook, right? How, how long standing these conversations that we snapshot in a moment in a newspaper article maybe have been going on. Um, so that, uh, yeah, no, it's true, it's true. Hey, and they have, uh, and these issues have been there even in museums then. There, there is a museum, there is the museum uh, uh, where the, the royal palaces are. It's a museum that exists since the, the 1930s. Uh, and that is a museum of the, uh, then the, the royal family and the, the, the kings who enslaved uh, people mm. uh, in that area, they have those uh, bas reliefs with uh, depicting these wars when uh, people were captured and so on. They, there are also a number of, of other objects that uh, tell the story associated with the slave trade. Then this exists there since the 1930s uh, during the colonial period. Then we have another museum that uh, is the, the Museum of uh, Weed that, that now is, the, is being renewed. They are totally renovating the, the fort where the, fort, the Portuguese mm. fort was. And there was an exhibition there that it, it is pretty much dated, but now they are, when the new fort uh, will be ready, then the fort will be uh, renovated there will be a new exhibition there uh, that, that then they are reconceiving the exhibition. In addition, they have all these monuments and all the idea of, of talking about the slavery there was to attract tourists to the country. Of course, uh, then tourists and tourists, of course, who have money to pay, then we are going to see much more, for example, American tourists going there than the Brazilians. And the Smithsonian, I think, that has been engaging in these conversations, uh, but they have been doing their own stuff for a while. And uh, I think that the Smithsonian can provide uh, expertise, then uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, advice, but they have been doing their, their work uh, for a while. And I, I am looking forward to seeing what uh, will be the result of all of this. Right. That's, I think, the most fascinating part of the, the constant changing nature of um, the subject matter. 